Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Counseling Compact Legislative Summit. Thank you for taking the time to be here and for your interest in learning more about the Counseling Compact. My name is Keith Buckout, and I'm a policy analyst for the Council of State Governments. I'm joined today by uh, a number of folks that I'll just introduce briefly now, but you'll hear more from later. The first is Lynn Lindy. She's the Chief of Professional Practice for the American Counseling Association. And on the CSG side of things, which is the organization I represent, is uh, joining me is Deputy Program Director uh, for the CSG National Center for Interstate Compacts, Carl Sims. Um, just a couple of just informational and housekeeping items. Um, you probably are pretty used to this by now, um, as we've lots of folks have been on these. But I uh, just wanted to reiterate this. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, and uh, so those who wanted to be here but uh, were not able to join at this time can review this material later. And also, we will share slides near the end of the meeting as well. Um, we'll put a PDF that folks can download in the chat. And so... Um, one of the most common questions we get is, can you share the slides? And yes, we will. We'll share that in the chat so everybody can download later. Um, as you can see at the top, please stay on mute unless uh, you're called upon from using the hand raise function. And please reserve questions until the Q&A portion of the agenda to allow folks to uh, focus on the um, material being presented. Uh, lastly, I just do want to share that we, uh, do, we do have a break scheduled midway through the agenda, so you don't have to be sitting at your screen uh, staring at it for two and a half hours. We understand that that's not anybody's idea of a good time. So uh, next, um, just a, this is just a brief overview of the agenda. Uh, these, um, so just so you know what to expect from the presentation today. Uh, and if you have to jump in and out, um, we understand that, you know, everybody has a day job or, uh, and that you might have to take a quick break. But um, if there's a particular item that you really want to make sure you can see that outlined in the, uh, that you, there's a particular agenda item where you really want to make sure you hear that content, um, then you can jump back in at that when you, and you know what to expect around that time. Um, that we'll provide more detailed information within each of these sections. Um, but with that, we look forward to sharing this information with you. So uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, before we go forward, I do wanna share a little bit about who we are at the Council of State Governments in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, CSG is a national membership organization for elected and appointed state officials. And as you can see, um, that's our uh, headquarters there. We are uh, that's our national headquarters in Lexington, Kentucky. We moved. We were founded in 1933 at the University of Chicago, but since we've moved to Lexington, um, we are the only organization serving all three branches of state government, and we support our members, those elected and appointed state officials, um, through providing policy research, uh, technical assistance and analysis, and uh, convening our members together to learn from one another. Uh, and next, in 2004, um, CSG launched a policy program aimed at helping states collaborate and develop solutions to multi-state problems uh, called the National Center for Interstate Compacts. Um, and so NCIC, as we call it, is a research-based and member-driven technical assistance center. Um, so, and we facilitate the consideration, creation, and revision of interstate compacts um, to address multi-state uh, issues and so and as solutions to those multi-state issues. So occupational licensure and things like license, licensing of professional counselors um, is one of those issues that all the states share. Um, and so uh, a little bit of background is that NCIC has facilitated the development or consulted on the development of all of the active 50 state compacts and every single one of the occupational licensure compacts that currently exist. So this is kind of what we do, um, and it's how we got to where we are now um, from CSG's perspective. Um, but for now, I'm actually going to uh, turn things over to Lynn Lindy from ACA um, for ACA's perspective before we get into the basics of compacts and the basics of the counseling compact. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Keith. I'm delighted to be here with all of you this afternoon, and I appreciate the fact that so many of you are attending. 
uh, the Legislative Summit. This is a project that is very important to the American Counseling Association. About six years ago, ACA signed a contract with the Council of State Governments National Center for Interstate Compacts to work on the Counseling Compact. At that time, we all knew that portability of licenses was a critical issue in the profession, and we needed some solutions to move the profession forward. And a number of us were at a an association, American Association for State Counseling Boards meeting when we heard Dan Logston, the director of NCIC, talk about compacts. And we all turned around and looked at each other and said, why aren't we doing this? This is a logical solution to the problem. It's not the only solution but it is a solution that involves all states. I, I sometimes talk about reciprocity agreements because I know many people are, are tied to their reciprocity agreements. I can never do the math quickly enough to figure out how many reciprocity agreements it would take for every state to have an agreement with every other state. With the compact, you have one compact. You have one piece of legislation that everybody adopts. So it's a really a remarkable legislative solution to our problems. It took our profession 33 years for every state to become, to have licensure. In three and a half years, we have 37 states that have 38 states, excuse me, that have joined the compact and the District of Columbia has passed it and it is waiting for the mayor's approval. So we have made incredible progress because the, the groundswell for having a compact is remarkable and everybody understands the importance of allowing counselors to practice across state lines, continuity of care and serving underserved populations. So we are delighted to be a sponsor of this. We've worked on this for a long time. We, uh, CSG brings remarkable expertise to the process, and I know you're going to enjoy working with them. So I look forward to our, our afternoon. Well, it's afternoon for me. And, uh, you know, please feel free at the end to ask questions to reach out to any of us. We're here to help. Thank you. Keith? You're muted. I thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you about that. I should have this down better by now. I apologize, everyone. But uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, I was just saying we've really enjoyed working with ACA and working with Lynn specifically. She's terrific to work with, and um, we've enjoyed uh, the opportunity to work with her immensely. Um, with that. Um, we will uh, get into a little bit of information, and this is a top level overview of the basics of interstate compacts. There are a lot of interstate compacts, um, and every single state is a member of at least one, um, and I think at least a dozen in most cases. And so we're going to provide a little bit of background on what is an interstate compact and what do they do and how are they used. So an interstate compact is a legislatively enacted agreement among states. It is a contract that states are party to and can join through enacting legislation. And so uh, interstate compacts cooperatively address shared problems rather than um, dictating a top-down solution. States can get together and decide on the best way to proceed and they can negotiate those terms. Um, it also allow, preserves state sovereignty over issues belonging to our states and our federal system. There are uh, issues reserved to the federal government and there are issues reserved to the states. Occupational licensure is one of those uh, issues that is reserved to the states. And so through an interstate compact like the counseling compact, states preserve the sovereignty over that, um, over that issue. And then lastly, um, it's applicable across lots of policy areas, including licensure. But uh, one of the first administrative compacts was actually the compact to create the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. So it can be used for things like major infrastructure and transit projects and not just um, occupational licensure. Um, here's some just basic information about interstate compact enactments. As I mentioned, there are lots of them. There are over 275. They are mentioned directly in the um, 
constitution, there's a compacts clause in the constitution. Um, one of those uses is for things like sharing natural resources. So like the Great Lakes Commission, um, it can also be for things like emergency management assistance, like you see there with EMAC. Um, each state has enacted between 20 and 80 compacts. Um, going way, way back, they did things like um, settle state borders. They were used for that purpose. Um, but they also, as I mentioned, with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and the Washington uh, Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, they can be used for things like administering large infrastructure organi and, and transit um, concerns between states. And so that's a big use of compacts as well. Um, as you can see there, there are um, over 2,000 total compact enactments. And on average, each state um, basically is a member of 42 different compacts. So they are a widely used, durable tool. Um, and um, we continue that legacy of interstate compacts through occupational licensure compacts. Um, just a brief overview specifically about occupational licensing uh, compacts. Um, they do a, they do three things that are really important for the um, licensing professions. So they do they facilitate multi-state practice. So rather than um, having to go navigate this uh, web or jungle of reciprocity agreements and um, sending different states your transcripts and supervision hours and all sorts of things like that, uh, they basically navigate that. Um, those uh, concerns for you. So it uh, makes multi-state practice much easier. Um, they also maintain or improve public health and safety because they allow states to cooperate on things like licensed discipline investigations and adverse actions. So to prevent bad actors, they do that through um, a requirement for state member states to uh, collaborate on those investigations and on those adverse actions. But they also um, all have a data system, and that's a pretty robust way for information sharing between those compact member states that allows um, states to know um, what is going on with licensees in their state. They are aware of issues, and they have that method of communication to ensure that um, uh, public health, their mission of public health and safety is preserved um, through, through interstate compacts, and we're really proud of that. Um, and lastly, and I mentioned this in one of the first slides, that they pre it preserves authority over professional licensing. Um, and so that is a um, professional licensing is a issue that is reserved to the states. And so uh, this allows states to direct that um, in the way that they see fit rather than relying on a federal solution. Um, this slide really d discusses a little bit more about how we got to um, how we came up with the idea for licensure compacts and how they're developed. So licensure compacts are possible because states have uniformity in their licensure regulations um, and their licensure requirements and regulations. So we say that they thrive on uniformity, that the foundation for licensure compacts um, and so when states have licensure requirements that are substantially similar in the way that they regulate those um, prof professions, then that profession is a good candidate for an occupational licensure compact. Additionally, um, compacts reflect the current licensure system across all states, and they, to that end, they drive uniformity So within the profession. So they encourage best practices um, among states. So as states join compacts and they are able to see the ways other states uh, license and regulate a profession, they can say, yeah, that seems to work really well. That makes sense for them. Um, this seems to be uh, a good way of licensing and ensuring uh, public protection and safety while meeting the needs of the professionals who work in this um, profession. And so it, it drives uniformity within that profession um, and allows uh, for um, fewer barriers between states and allows professionals the um, benefit of one set of standards um, so that they can basically move between states and have that licensure mobility um, by driving that uniformity. And lastly, uh, compacts are not one size fits all. So um, 
compacts, uh, we, we often say at CSG, if you've seen one licensure compact, you've seen one licensure compact. So uh, there are, um, while most of the licensure compacts have been in the allied health professions, um, the cosmetology licensure compact just established its compact commission this week. And so um, there's a diverse range of professions and that profession has different requirements and um, different needs than, for instance, the counseling compact, just like nursing has different uh, licensure requirements and regulation and a compact uh, specifics than the counseling compact as well. And so um, while there are, th there are key features that are in common among all licensure compacts, they each are tailored to meet the needs of each individual profession. Um, these are just a, some brief stats about um, occupational licensure compacts to show that they are a popular tool and a durable tool for states. So 47 states, three territories, and the District of Columbia have adopted at least one of these. Um, so they are widely used. States recognize that these are um, a good way of managing uh, of managing um, occupational licensure collectively and working together. Um, over 365 pieces have of occupational licensure compact legislation have been enacted since January of 2016. So that's uh, almost seven years now. So um, three, almost 400 pieces of legislation in seven years is pretty good. And there are currently 17 uh, compacts for occupational licensing as well. Uh, next, you can see, uh, this is just a heat map that uh, we had our data team put together of licensure compact participation by state. So I mentioned that there's 47 states, three territories, and the District of Columbia have joined at least one of these. Um, there are a few notable holdouts that you can see there that I haven't enacted one of them. So California, New York, and Massachusetts are among those. Um, but we're um, working with those states pretty closely to see if we can get them on board. Um, but as you can see, you can go through this map and look at your state and see um, how many licensure compacts your state has enacted. There are several states that have um, enacted all of the ones that are available to states so far, uh, in particular Colorado. And so um, the, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an important way of recognizing that uh, states recognize that this is a helpful tool to them and it allows the mobility that per, uh, practitioners need um, in a modern society. Um, this is just a, the same information, but represented as a bar graph, but um, uh, broken down by the uh, individual compact. So as you can see, um, some states have a few more enactments um, than others. That is just a function for the most part of how recently the compact was created. So for instance, I just mentioned cosmetologists. That was released to states um, about two years ago now. Same with dentists and dental hygienists and teachers. Um, but the um, uh, sort of the uh, uh, trailblazers of this licensure compact um, system were uh, physicians, nurses, and psychologists. And so they have all reached 42 states um, in their enactment, but they have been at this for uh, uh, several more years than those compacts that you can see um, down at the bottom. With that, um, that's just a broad overview of compacts in general. And uh, if we understand that you might have questions about that comp content, we will uh, have a Q&A at the um, end of this presentation. And so uh, if you have questions, maybe just jot yourself a note and we'll, um, we'll be sure, happy to address that um, later in the presentation. But for now, I'm gonna keep things going to be respectful of everyone's time with a brief overview of the counseling compact. Um, and as I go through, if uh, Lynn and Carl, if there are any um, important notes or remarks that you want to make sure that the audience hears as I go through, uh, feel free to unmute, jump in, and um, uh, get uh, pause my presentation so that uh, we can make sure that the audience gets all the information they need. That, so uh, this is just a broad um, top line um, uh, outline of how the cause or the how sorry excuse me how the counseling uh, compact works so a state joins the compact by in adopting the model legislation so as i said these are contracts between states the way that a state becomes a party to this contract is by adopting the model legislation through its legislature and being approved by the governor um 
The model legislation includes requirements for states and individual practitioners. So there is a section on what states have to require for uh, to issue a license and how they regulate the profession for them to be eligible to join. And then there's similarly there are requirements for licensed professional counselors for how they are whether they are able to access the compact. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later in the section by section review. Um, the compact legislation renegotiates the recognition of out of state of an out of state license through a compact privilege to practice. A privilege to practice carries all the same benefits in a state of licensure, but without having to go through the individual state by state um, uh, full licensure process. So um, this has pre-negotiated that process, and there's a stiff there's a application that uh, uh, licensed professional counselors will be able to go through um, that makes that less burdensome. And then a counselor who is licensed and lives in a compact member state. That is, those are two important topics. Uh, licensed and lives in a compact member state um, can apply for a privilege to practice in another compact member state through the compact. Um, those are the basics. Um, and if you get nothing else from that, um, that just those top line in, um, details are important um, for when the compact activates and starts issuing privileges to practice. Um, next, the, a compact privilege, can, as I mentioned before, confers the same benefits as licensure. Um, so to that end, so states have asked before, well, what is a privilege to practice? Uh, we've had, we got the question a lot. A privilege to practice is legally equivalent to having a license in that state. It's just applied for through the compact. And um, to that, uh, there's different rules about how the... Um, uh, about how that privilege to practice works. You, for instance, it doesn't carry the same requirements. For instance, you don't have to do uh, continuing education in that remote state. You, uh, It's on the renewal schedule of your home state license, things like that. But that privilege confers the same benefits to being able to practice in that remote state. Um, and a comp But a compact privilege must be applied for in each compact member state if as a counselor, you want to provide services in a different state other than your home state and you apply for the compact that or, and if you want, if you want to practice in that state, you have to apply through the compact to get that privilege to practice. And then um, this is very important. Counselors must abide by the laws and regulations for practice in the state where they uh, want to provide services. And that is based that is determined by where the client is located at the time. Um, that service is provided. And so each you have to abide by the scope of practice in the state where the client is located, not where you are located or not your state's, um, your home state's scope of practice. So your scope of practice as a practitioner does not travel with you. It is based on where the client is located. Um, and that is really important for each licensed professional counselor to know. And again, Carl or Lynn, feel free to stop me if there's... Uh, anything that comes up that uh, you think folks should know. Um, top level overview of the benefits of a compact privilege. Um, you don't have to figure out what the network and the patchwork of each individual state's licensure requirements are. There is a uniform and centralized application for that. Um, there will be more details about that forthcoming. You'll be able to find that on the Counseling Compact website um, over the next months and probably hopefully targeting um, 2026 in that. Um, so um, they're making a lot of progress towards that. Um, the licensure requirements are uniform and they're spelled out in the compact. So you can look at the compact rather than having to go to each state, which is helpful. You don't have to navigate that whole um, process. Um, it is also faster than having to go through uh, the individual state by state licensure process. So you have you have a qualifying license through your home state, and then you can go to the uh, compact privilege to practice application. The compact um, will have licensee data so that they know that you know, for instance, they can verify your credentials. And it goes much faster than having it for each state having to fill out the application, provide your documentation, um, and make sure that you are eligible, and then um, issue you a license. In this situation, because you already have your home state has already verified that, it is a much faster process. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, renewal cycles will match your home state license. You will have to renew that compact privilege at the same time you renew your home state license. 
um, uh, but it does not require continuing education in every state in which you carry a privilege. You maintain your home state license and you have to do the continuing education to keep that home state license active um, and unencumbered, but you do not have to do, meet the CE requirements in every other state. And so um, that's a big benefit because under uh, when you have carrying uh, multiple individual uh, state licenses, to maintain those licenses and to renew those licenses, you would have to meet those CE requirements in every state, but not through the compact. Um, this is just a visual that we find very helpful for folks to um, explain how a privilege to practice works. So if you start flows left to right, you um, apply for your home state and you, uh, your home state there, it, your home compact member state verifies that uh, you are eligible for a license in their state. Um, that is important because this compact has a residency requirement. You do have to live in a compact member state. And so you go to your home state licensure border agency, you apply for that individual license. And then um, your um, as you uh, get, receive that license and maintain that active and unencumbered license, you are eligible to apply for a privilege to practice through the compact. So through because uh, your home state has verified that you met the um, requirements of the compact, you are then able to access that application for a privilege to practice. You go, you follow that gray arrow there, and then um, through the compact, you apply for a privilege to practice in each other, in each state in which you don't live or aren't already licensed to be able to get that privilege to practice in a remote state. Um, so with um, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, again, we'll share the slides at the end and that's a pretty helpful visual so that everybody can understand how that privilege system works. Um, a brief overview of what the state requirements are for to be a member of the um, counseling compact. Um, obviously, if you don't license professional counselors, you're not eligible to uh, join the compact. Um, so each state that um, fortunately licenses uh, licensed professional counselors, that's the first requirement. Um, they have to have a they have to use a national exam. Um, that uh, is a that was the development teams um, knew that that was an important requirement. It creates that uh, licensure uniformity that drives compacts that we talked about, um, and um, makes sure that it uh, streamlines those uh, licensure requirements and drives uniformity. Let me uh, jump in for a second. The three exams that the commission is accepting are the NCE, the National Clinical Mental Health Exam, and the CCRC. So your state has to use one of those exams, and those are the three exams that every state uses. Yes, thank you, Lynn. That is very helpful. I appreciate that added context. That is something that licensees um, would find important as well. Um, you have to have, uh, a, a, moving forward, uh, in addition to that national exam, states are required to have and maintain a re um, requirement for licensure that of supervised postgraduate professional experience. They, uh, there is the requirement for a 60 semester hour master's degree in the state requirement section. And it also requires states to investigate complaints and require and uh, obligate states to do that uh, jointly um, in instances and to work together on um, investigation of complaints um, um, so to um, ensure that public protection and public safety mandates for those state licensure board and agencies are met. And it also um, really, because of that shared data system, um, uh, it provides an enhanced um, public protection and public safety mandate um, by allowing states to work together on those and share information. Um, there's also, this is um, when we'll get this into this more with the practitioner requirements as well. Um, so these are the requirements, not that states have to put on licensees, but that each individual licensed professional counselor has to meet to be eligible to use the compact. So the first one is you have to live in a compact member state. So your home state is uh, as a has to be a compact member state. If you live or are licensed in a state that is not yet a, or if you live and are licensed in a state that is not yet a compact member state, 
we need to work on getting your state to enact the compact so that you'll be eligible because only those who live in compact member states are eligible. Um, you have to provide a social security number or a national pr practitioner identifier number. Um, this is important for that public protection, public safety aspect. There can't be any adverse actions against a, your license within the past two years. Uh, further, as part of that public protection and public safety mandate is that uh, to um, access the compact, you have to, uh, each licensee has to submit to an FBI background check. Um, this is again, as part of making sure that the public is protected and that pub, uh, public health and safety standards are met. Um, we wanna make sure that, that, uh, that only um, those who are practicing at the top of the profession and no bad actors get through. And so we require that FBI background check. Um, Next, and this is a, something I mentioned in prior slides, you have to adhere to the scope of practice for the state in which the client is located at the time that um, service and care is provided. So your home state scope of practice does not travel with you to where a, um, to where a client might be. Uh, so it's important, for instance, that you uh, research differences in scope of practice and the commission um, Hopefully we'll be providing resources on that soon um, about potential differences in scope of practice. But uh, um, it's important to note, remember that your scope of practice uh, is based on the where the client is located at the time care and services are provided. And then lastly, this has been, we've mentioned this a couple of times prior, but uh, licensees are required to um, complete the continuing education in their home state only, not in the states where they might have a privilege. So uh, uh, per counselors need to do the CE and meet the CE requirements to maintain their home state and to be able to renew their home state license, but they do not need to do the continuing education requirements in remote states where they carry a privilege. With that, um, here's a a broad overview of the current status of the counseling compact. And with that, uh, Carl, I believe this is, um, I'm going to hand things over to you. All right. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so yeah, we'll go into more detail of the compact legislation after this section, but uh, first I want to give you all just a uh, status update of where the counseling compact is at. So here you'll see the current map that we have uh, and this is available on the Counseling Compact website. I just posted the link in the chat here. So you'll see the states in the uh, darker shade of blue there are current Compact members. Um, and then those in the light blue, currently just Pennsylvania, are the only ones with pending legislation still remaining in 2024. And then those in the gray states of which uh, you might be um, uh, uh, live in um, or be licensed in, um, they have yet to enact the Compact. Um, on the Compact website, uh, you'll find links to prior legislative attempts that might be a part of your state. So I recommend checking out that link if you're curious to see, if, well, has the compact legislation been filed at all here? So it can give you a little bit of that history uh, today. But um, I'll just say, and what you might recall from that heat map uh, that Keith showed earlier, is that there are states that have um, been adopting legislature compacts on a much more frequent basis than others. Each state's gonna be its own story as to why or why it hasn't. Um, but we do think and, and see that as more states are joining legislature compacts, the value increases for the states that are currently members of them and that prospective value for those that have yet to join them. So it, it does show, um, you know, that, you know, you're getting more access to uh, practitioners from those states and then uh, your practitioners will have more access to um, other states as well there. Um, we keep this uh, map uh, fairly well updated as the legislative uh, process unfolds itself. So um, check that uh, regularly for any updates that might occur if you're uh, unsure if there is any uh, recent movement uh, in your state. Uh, we are at 37 states for the counseling compact, um, and that's over the course of just uh, four years, um, almost to this point, which is really impressive. You know that there have been lecture compacts that, of course, have been in existence for um, over a decade now, and and the counseling compact is close to their number of enacted uh, member states. And I think that's a testament to two things. Uh, one, it's the uh, what states are recognizing as the, uh, the need for um, counseling services and the need to help provide greater access to those services uh, for their residents. And two, I would also say that there is growing familiarity across states about legislature compacts. 
uh, what they are, uh, what they mean for states, what they don't mean for states sometimes can be as equally as important. Um, but because of that increased familiarity and seeing now some of the uh, the uses of the compacts that are operational, um, I think it's helping along with some of those uh, states that might not have been uh, as quick to enact compacts um, or might want to uh, have chosen to wait a, few, uh, a while in order for some of the progress to unfold itself there. So on the next slide, You'll see here that legislative uh, history here. I'll, I'll walk you through some of these numbers here. So um, you'll see from 2021, there were two enacting states. Um, and then everything you see there in the uh, darker shade of blue there are what the compact began with at the beginning part of that year. So in 2022, we had started with those two states. Uh, but that grew. 16 states enacted compact in 2022, uh, 13 more in 2023, and then six so far this year to get us to that 37 number. Uh, so you can see that rapid growth that, we, that we're experiencing with the counseling compact. Um, again, uh, we think that is a good reflection that states are recognizing uh, the need for increased mobility for um, LPCs and, and what that can mean for uh, providing care to those in need. On the next slide, uh, you'll see that timeline um, where the compact became available for state adoption. That was in uh, the, towards the end of 2020, December of 2020. Um, Georgia became the first state in 2021. And then Nebraska became the 10th state in 2022. And the 10th state designation is, um, is special because in the compact legislation and what's in all legislature compact legislation is that there is a prerequisite number of states that need to enact the compact uh, before the compact become active. Now, by active, we don't mean that, okay, the compacts are ready to go and, and LPCs can start applying for those compact privileges. There's still a process in place that we'll be describing uh, as to, to, to which we'll be working towards being able to grant those compact privileges. But being that 10th state enacts the provisions within the compact so that those 10 states and then those states that are joining afterwards can begin that process. They can be in their compact commission. That's the government agency uh, that is created by the compact and is represented by the compact member states, those from their licensing boards, including administrators, uh, who are working out the terms of it. So I think we had posted uh, in the chat here uh, one of the rules, for example, that was issued by the compact commission, naming those national exams. So that's an example of one of the uh, pieces of work that the commission uh, does as it's uh, working to become operational. Um, that Compact Commission met for the first time in October of 2022 and has since been working towards that uh, process to be able to grant privileges. Next slide, please. So comp again, Compact privileges are not yet being issued. Um, the goal right now is for that to occur in 2025. Uh, there are a few key things that need to be in place before uh, that happens. And the biggest part, and I'll have a slide, Following this one to explain in more detail is the compact data system. Uh, but there are other things that, that need to happen. So the compact commission, as I said, is a government agency, and that requires time to get those processes in place, the, the governance structure, establishing bylaws, establishing committees, um, issuing rules, everything that's needed to support the operations of the compact need to be in place as well. Uh, there are things for compact member states to also do simultaneously with the compact commission's work. Uh, that will include onboarding to the data system once it's ready. If they don't currently have a background check in place, uh, getting that uh, set uh, and then providing a fee schedule. So what they would be charging uh, an LPC in order to purchase a privilege of practice in their state, uh, getting that established many times that has to be done in rule. On the next slide uh, regarding the data system. So the data system, the provisions for that is outlined in compact legislation. We'll have a slide more on what that, how that reads specifically later on. Uh, but very simply, the data system is what makes the compact work. It is what is the background technology has a forward-facing application that will allow an LPC to go to the Compact Commission website and then purchase a privilege to practice um, in, in a quick time manner. So there, the data system is there to help um, have that information that states are providing to it about who is eligible for the compact and that's why it's able to be a quick process, um, because the data system is checking on what states have already provided to confirm that, yes, this LPC that I've licensed in my state and meets the qualifications of the compacts can receive the compact privilege. And the model legislation states that states are adopting says that, yes, we will grant a compact privilege to anyone who meets those requirements. So the data system is making all that work. 
It's also there to help with cases of adverse action. So it allows the facilitation of information that states can share on significant investigatory information, as well as adverse action so that they can consider uh, the information they're receiving from other states. And then based on their own state's laws and regulations, make their own determination of whether they need to make a simultaneous action or take no action based on their laws and regulations. Uh, so with the data system, uh, again, that work is um, under underway and the specific website that we have uh, to talk about that system and progress updates is compactconnect.org, link there in the slide in case you're curious uh, to learn more about that project. For uh, commission committees, just showing again, the scope of the commission's work, um, there's a lot of supporting uh, um, efforts that need to be uh, uh, taken to make the compact uh, successful here. So the commission is organized under different committees, which have different functions uh, to serve in that process here. So just showing this as an example um, of those types of, of roles uh, there on the Counseling Compact website, you'll see the uh, commission webpage that has a lot more information about uh, commissioners that have been appointed by states, um, as well as uh, some of the you know rules that have been passed, meeting minutes, how to attend one of those meetings. So I highly encourage you to check that out if you're interested to learn more there. And then here I'll pass it back over to Keith so we can do more of a deep dive on the compact model legislation. Keith? Great. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate uh, your uh, going over all that. That's helpful information. Um, important background. Um, so this is where we get into the real, um, very specific, very detail-oriented um, matters uh, and policies that are contained in the model legislation. And so it's a big document. You know, we don't necessarily expect everyone to, you know, go through all um, every single page line by line, but we have done that because um, Lynn and others at CSG um, developed it. And and so, um, but we're going to go through a top line of each in, of each section now so that you have an idea of what's in this um, model legislation and what's in the legislation that each member state has enacted or um, that states will, that your member state or that your state will enact in the future. So the first section is what we call a purpose statement and it is there to inform the policymakers um, of what we were trying to accomplish when we wrote this um, when we wrote this piece of model legislation. Uh, states are not necessarily required to include this when they file their enacting legislation. Um, there are some states that do not um, because they you know it doesn't necessarily change the the law um, when they enact it. But it's a good guide for when there's questions about what the intent is of this bill. And so a couple of top uh, three important things to know about this section, um, the intent of the counseling compact or the purpose of the counseling compact is to facilitate interstate practice of licensed professional counselors. Makes sense, um, hopefully to everyone. Um, and the second one is it's to improve public access to professional counseling services. That's important. So. Um, we want to be. We want each licensed professional counselor who wants to practice um, at the um, to their fullest uh, capabilities and to their fullest capacity to be able to do that. And sometimes that means that they um, need to uh, that they should be able to um, practice in states in which they do not live or outside their ex like geographic community. And so um, it pr improves access to professional counseling services by allowing counselors to go to where the need is greatest. Um, and then it preserves the regulator, regulatory authority of the states. So states maintain um, sovereignty over their licensure requirements, their regulation of the practice, and their, their practice act, their scope of practice. So states all maintain sovereignty over that. This isn't a federal or uh, federal takeover. This isn't allowing other states to dictate those things. States proactively choose to join this compact or not. Um, so it allows states to maintain that authority over those um, issues regarding licensure of professional counselors. And again, um, Lynn, Carl, if there's something as I go along um, in this section by section overview, feel free to stop me um, and um, let me point things out and let me know or let the audience know um, some important other aspects if I don't mention them directly. Uh, section two is an, an important section. It is the everything after this is required to be in the model legislation. Uh, this is definition, so it defines terms in the model legislation and in the bill 
that um, um, basically are important for everyone understands it on the, on the same page about what this means. I'm going to just include the one here of what the definition of a licensed professional counselor is. And it's a, li a counselor licensed by a member state, regardless of title. Um, we know that, you know, there might be a different title in different member states um, and that um, so it's not just restricted to just, you know, whether your state uses the LPC, um, but it is um, a um, definition that includes that the requirements that um, a lic the licensee must independently assess, diagnose, and treat behavioral health co conditions. And so that is an important um definition to point out in section two. Um, and if there is any other definitions in there that you have questions about, you can follow up with us later, or you can um, answer, ask that in the Q&A. Um, but that's the big one that we want to point out. Section three, um, and we've uh, I touched on this earlier in the top line overview of the counseling compact, but this is the section that spells out what requirements states have to have already to join the compact and what they are required to do to maintain their membership and stay in compliance within the compact once they join. So a member state must license and regulate licensed professional counselors regardless of title, as I mentioned on the slide before. It also requires licensees to pass a nationally recognized exam. Lynn mentioned that those three exams earlier. If you have questions about that, we can follow up with that in more detail. It'll also be on the compact website. Um, it also requires licensees to have a 60 hour master's degree in counseling or 60 hours of graduate coursework in those relevant areas. So states are required to um, have those as have that as a license as a licensure requirement to to be able eligible to join the compact. Then it requires licensees to complete a supervised or it requires states to require licensees to complete a supervised postgraduate professional experience. Okay, I'm um, going to jump in for a second. Absolutely. The compact does not designate how many hours of post-degree supervision a counselor has to have. That's part of initial licensure, and the compact accepts whatever it is the state has designated for its initial license. So if um, you're going to be working in a state that requires more hours than the state where you're licensed and you're applying for a privilege, you don't have to do additional hours of post-degree supervision. It's whatever your own state requires. Great, thank you, Lynn. And this is why I mentioned earlier that we really enjoy working with Lynn and why Lynn is the best. She, um, when we skip over the top line details, uh, Lynn is able to jump in and provide the real um, information that um, everybody needs to know um, and with uh, profession specific information. And so thank you, Lynn, that's a good, it's an important note. Uh, lastly, um, and this is part of that public protection. So you, we license professions to ensure public safety and public health and public protection. And so uh, states are required to have a mechanism or a way to receive and investigate complaints of licensed professional counselors. And so um, that makes sense. The only, uh, uh, our um, the director of the National Center for Interstate Compacts is uh, his name's Dan Logsdon. We hope he'll be able to join us later today. Um, he is fond of saying that the only reason for states to offer a, a to license profession is so that if something goes wrong or if they screw up or if they hurt someone, they can take that license away. Um, this is that why that requirement is in the compact. So um, in to make sure that uh, clients are protected and to make sure the public is protected, they have to have that mechanism for receiving and investigating complaints. Every state has that. So. Um, just a little bit more about state participation. So what states have to, that was a lot about what states have to have already to be able to enact the compact and join. Um, and this is a little bit more about what states have to continue to do to maintain their membership in the compact and stay in compliance. So they have to participate in the data system. That is how um, we, that is a big way that we ensure that enhanced level of public protection and safety. That's how we um, work together jointly on um, investigations and discipline. Um, and it's an important part of compact membership for states. Um, as again, as part of that data system piece, notify the commission of any adverse action against current licensees, um, especially when that's significant investigative information. 
Um, so there, you know, the compact can provide a little bit more um, detail about what the what current significant investigative information is via rule. Um, but that uh, we really want to know if there's an imminent threat to public health and safety. That's the reason for current significant investigative information. And so when it's really important that you suspend that license, that that uh, practitioner is no longer able to meet with clients at all to ensure public health and safety, um, that's when we use that significant investigative information and we want that as quickly as possible. Um, states are required uh, to conduct criminal background checks for candidates for an initial privilege of practice. So once you, your, state, your state may not have required a background check for your initial home state license, but you are required to submit to a background, but they are required to submit applicants for a privilege to practice to a background check. Um, and that's just part of, uh, there's an enhanced responsibility that comes with um, being able to participate in multi-state practice. And so we want to make sure that nobody slips through the cracks that shouldn't be, shouldn't have that privilege. And so um, that's the reason for those criminal background checks and why we want to make sure that um, those who are, um, that those who are, are not a danger to the public have access to um, practice in remote states. Second, um, they have to grant the privilege to practice to professional counselors uh, to a licensee holding a valid unencumbered license in another compact member state. States can't just pick and choose to say that, yep, we want this person who has a valid license, but we don't have this. We don't want this person to have a valid license. States, once they join the compact, do not get that discretion. So if there is a licensee in a compact member state whose license is valid and unencumbered and that person applies for a privilege to practice in a compact member state, so if that license, if their home state license is valid and unencumbered um, and active, and they pay the fee for that privilege to practice, the compact ensures that that licensee gets that privilege to practice. And then um, lastly, um, you have to, the so compacts are a collection, they are a function of member states. And so um, to make sure that the compact is administered um, and, re and run appropriately, um, each state appoints a delegate or a commissioner to the compact commission. Um, and states are required to make sure that that person shows up for the meetings that they are required and that they participate in the meetings of the commission. So you want your state to be represented in the goings on of the commission where rules and bylaws and things are created to make sure that your state is administering the compact correctly. Next, we'll go to section four, and this is about the privilege to practice, and this is the requirements for each for the licensed professional counselors to be eligible to use the compact. So prior, we talked about what the state requirements are to issue licenses, what states have to require of applicants for licensure, and what they are required to do to, to continue participation in the compact. This is what is required by the compact of licensed professional counselors to be able to apply for those privileges to practice in remote states. Um, so a licensee must hold a license in their home state and that state has to be a member, an active member of the compact. Um, pretty straightforward. We have to be, make sure that um, you know, you're eligible and that the only way to do that is by being a licensed, uh, having a license in your home state, which is a member of the compact. Then, uh, as we mentioned uh, at the top line overview earlier, you can't have any encumbrances or restrictions on your license within the previous two years. And, you know, that's part of that, when I mentioned earlier, sort of uh, higher, uh, more higher requirements for, uh, for counselors who want to engage in multi-state practice. Um, you know, if you might be licensed in just your home state and only want to practice there, um, and you might be eligible to do that with an encumbrance on your license within the past two years, but to make sure that uh, the public is protected in, the, in every member state and in remote states, the, um, the development teams for this compact determined that they felt most comfortable and they thought it would protect the public best if only those licensees and those counselors who didn't have any encumbrances or restrictions on their license within the past two years were, able to, were eligible to access the compact and apply for privileges in remote states. Uh, then... Um, because we um, the scope of scope of practice did not travel with you, your home state uh, scope of practice did not travel with you. Um, to be issued a privilege to practice, you have to meet any jurisprudence requirements of the remote state 
that you are applying for. So um, a remote state can require you to meet those, to pass a jurisprudence exam. They can make sure that you are, to make sure that you understand and are following that, uh, that other, that remote state scope of practice. Um, so whenever you are uh, providing care to or meeting with a client in a remote state, um, make sure that you understand those jurisprudence requirements in the state in which that client is located. And then um, finally on this slide, um, uh, so uh, practitioners are required to report any adverse action, encumbrance, or restriction on their license by that they might have from a non-member state within 30 days of that action. Um, that's again, part of that higher standard and that public protection aspect. And we want to make sure that the public and clients are protected. Um, and so if a licensed professional counselor has an adverse action or encumbrance on their license, if they carry a license in a non-compact member state, then they are required to report that to the um, commission within 30 days of that adverse action, um, just so that we can maintain, maintain that public protection and that client protection um, standard. Um, keep moving along here. Um, section five, and this is an important one for licensees. We get a lot of questions about this. Um, and this is about transferring a privilege to practice in a remote state to a new home state. So when uh, a licensee has to move, one of the most difficult parts of this, in addition to, you know, packing up your um, residence and moving and finding a new address and, you know, doing all of that stuff, uh, you don't want to also have to ha go through a hassle of getting a new home state license. Um, but because in a through a compact, because you are able, uh, and a remote state has already authorized you to practice in that state as if you had a license in that state. If you move between compact member states, a state has already verified that you are eligible for a compact and has already been allowing you to practice there through a privilege to practice. And so there should be an expedited way to move your home state license to another compact member state through a compact. And so this creates an alternative pathway um, an expedited pathway to be able to do that. So um, just using two examples here, just based on where I live. So I'm here, I live in Kentucky as a part of our CSU's headquarters are here in Kentucky. And if I wanted to move to Ohio and they're both compact member states. So when I moved to Ohio and I established residency there and I had a privilege to practice in Ohio, I could notify the uh, through the compact, the Ohio licensing board, I have a privilege to practice here. I live in Ohio now. Please convert my privilege to practice to a new home state license and then deactivate my home state license in Kentucky. You're only allowed to have one home state license at a time, just as you only have one home state. You might live in multiple states. You might have residences in multiple states, but you only have one home state. Um, and so through this, you are able to convert a privilege to practice to a new home state license because we've already verified that you're qualified and uh, eligible to use this compact. And so we, you shouldn't have to be put through that licensure, that initial licensure process all over again. Um, and the compact allows that to happen. Um, it's an important feature of the compact and one that really benefits um, licensees and enhances that mobility. Um, this is just uh, adding to that, what I mentioned before. Um, it's important to note that nothing in the compact affects a member state's requirements for issuance of a single state license. And so um, states are still are able to maintain their requirements for initial licensure um, and single state licenses. So for instance, let's say uh, California, and I'll just pick on California here, um, is not currently a member of the compact, um, but um, let's say Colorado. So somebody moves from California to Colorado. Um, they had a license in California, but they do not yet have a license in Colorado. Um, Colorado uh, still is able to maintain their uh, individual and single state and license application process for that person because they're coming from California, a non-compact member state. So that's still, that initial licensure requirement still applies. Uh, section six, um, a, a lot of these interstate compacts uh, have provisions that are specific to active duty military personnel and their spouses. And that's simply because 
the military community um, is highly mobile. They can be ordered to a new duty station every two to three years. And so if you imagine if you had to move every two to three years and have to go through, uh, get your renew your or get a new license every two to three years, sounds pretty bad. Um, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, and so the counseling compact has a section that allows um, an active duty service member or their spouse to designate a home state where the individual has a current license in good standing and, and to be able to access the compact this way. And that state then serves as the individual's home state for the duration of the service member's active duty. So even so let's say that uh, you were initially stationed in um, Tennessee and um, as an active duty service member um, and you are licensed there, but then you get relocated to California, um, you can still designate uh, Tennessee as your home state for the purpose of the compact because you had that license there and you can still continue to use Tennessee to, as your license state to access the compact, but that only applies to active duty military personnel and their spouses. Um, this section uh, talks about the compact privilege to practice through telehealth. That's an important uh, aspect for uh, counseling and for mental health professions overall, but especially for counselors, we know that that's important. Um, and so that this section establishes that the privilege to practice under the compact includes telehealth provisions to allow um, you to care for patients in remote states. Um, it's important to remember, license if you're providing telehealth uh, to a client in a remote state, abide by the scope of practice, the laws and regulations of where of the state in which the client is located. So um, know where that uh, client is located when you are having a telehealth, um, uh, when you're providing telehealth services, and then abide by that state's scope of practice. It's very important. Um, section eight covers what happens if maybe you don't abide by the scope of practice in the state in which the client is located at the time you're providing services. This is the adverse action section. Um, and so this section does a lot of things. It specifies what actions member states can take um, based on whether it is your home state or whether, whether it's your a remote state, but it um, covers what happens should you should a licensee, a licensed professional counselor, run afoul of the license of the regulations um, governing um, practice in the compact member states. So this section clarifies that only a practitioner's home state can take adverse action against that home state license, that qualifying license. This is what gets you access to the compact. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is important because there's a legal principle that basically uh, states can't act to take away something that they didn't issue. So a remote state, um, in the Kentucky and Ohio example I used earlier, so because I live in Kentucky, Ohio didn't issue my home state license, so they can't take away my home state license. But what they can do, because they issued it, is take away my privilege to practice. Kentucky can take away my home state license because I live here in Kentucky and I'd be licensed here, um, but Ohio cannot. And so that's an important aspect of compacts and an important legal principle. But remote states are authorized to take adverse action against a counselor's privilege to practice. They can issue subpoenas for things like documents of witness testimony and things like that, get all the information as part of those investigations. Um, and and if, a, if the offense is serious enough, like for instance, let's say I'm a, as a licensed professional counselor from Kentucky, but I'm meeting a client in Ohio, if I um, screw up badly enough, Compact member states can uh, and may and are required to participate in joint investigations to ensure that public that um, that the public is protected and that uh, I don't continue to harm clients um, as a professional counselor in remote states. And so they can work together on investigations that require um, licensee discipline. Um, it's important to clarify what can and can't happen as part of this adverse action. So states can and investigate a compact privilege holders for actions taken in their state. So they can act against, st remote states can act against that privilege to practice the same way that they do a license. It's just that they can't take away the home state license. Hello. Sorry, I think I was on a page, so I didn't okay. Please, uh, sorry everyone, please remember to uh, stay on mute if you can um, as we go through the presentation. Um, but states can um, investigate a compact privilege for actions taken in their state. What you can't do is take action 
um, for uh, actions taken that, for instance, uh, aren't in your state. Um, so when a um, when a state can basically through the compact um, share information about an adverse action taken against a privilege to practice, they can put that in there um, and they can participate in joint investigations. Uh, but they can't act on a license or privilege issued by another member state. So um, uh, they are not able, for instance, to open an investigation based on something that you may have done legally in another compact member state. Uh, obviously, this has been an important consideration um, in a post-Dobbs decision world, and we know that that's a sensitive topic. Um, but it's important to note that through the compact, uh, states can't just go on a fishing expedition looking for something that may have violate their scope of practice, but that was done in a state where is within the scope of practice in another state. So they can't just go on a fishing expedition looking for a legal activity in states that went that aren't within their borders. Um, states also can't deny a privilege or investigate a counselor for lawful action in another state. That really summarizes what I was saying earlier. So as, as a Kentucky uh, like in my example as a Kentucky licensee, if I'm practicing in Ohio and I do think something as a counselor that's in the scope of practice in Ohio, but that isn't within the scope of practice in Kentucky, Kentucky can't come after me for doing something that's allowed in Ohio. Um, and states can't uh, also then reach across their borders to specify the laws and regulations a counselor must follow in a remote state. That's just part of maintaining that state sovereignty over scope of practice and maintaining authority over the license and regulation of professional counselors. Um, lastly, we're just going to keep hammering this point home because it's so important. Privilege holders must abide by the laws and regulations of the state in which the client is located at the time service is provided. Can't stress that enough. It's very, very important. So section nine, uh, I, you know, I, I hope that this isn't as that important as important to you, but it is an important aspect of how a uh, interstate compact works. So the compact commission, this is the agent, the joint government agency that administers the compact on behalf of the member states. Each state appoints a commissioner to this organization and they represent their state on this commission and help each state administer the compact. So this also, this section outlines um, who is to be appointed as the commissioner. It also specifies the powers of the compact commission. So as I mentioned, each state's board selects a delegate or a commissioner. It can be the board administrator or a board member who is a counselor or a public member. And each delegate has one vote on commission affairs. So it's not weighted by, for instance, how many licensees a state um, brings to the compact. Each state gets one vote and on behalf of their delegate or commissioner. Um, section 10 outlines the data system. So we have to specify what uh, the data system has to be able to do and should do uh, for the compact and what information is shared and how it's shared. Some of that is further defined in bylaws and rules by the compact commission that we just talked about in section nine, but some of it is specified in statute in the model legislation and the, uh, the counseling compact does that here in section 10. So you, first it requires that a data system um, be in place for the co uh, counseling uh, compact. And so the commission has to develop, maintain, and operate this coordinated data and reporting system to make sure that uh, they are being, work, re working together to um, ensure public health and safety as part of that public health and safety mandate on behalf of the boards and agencies. Um, the data system must contain licensure, adverse action, and current significant investigative information on licensees. And the data system must facilitate the issuance of compact privileges and allow compact member states to enforce adverse actions um, as a, in accordance with that uh, adverse action section of the compact in section eight. I think we can move on from the data system there. Um, there will also, it's important to note that with the data system, there will be a public facing aspect. It's not just for the member states themselves, but you'll be able to look up, the public will be able to look up, for instance, through the public facing section, who has a privilege to practice in which remote state. So there is a public facing aspect to that data system as well. Um, 
Section 11 goes over rulemaking, and this is just covers what the commission is able to do via rule and what the commission is not able to do via rule. Um, they are limited in the scope to ad properly administering the compact and carrying out the business of the compact. So they can't, for instance, create crazy rules that don't apply to the compact just to try to um, sort of correct other issues that may exist within the license and regulation of the profession um, or uh, other regulatory matters that might not have anything to do with the profession at all. So it's very limited in rulemaking just to what the compact says it can do. Um, they do carry the force of law in member states. States sometimes come back and say, well, why would we give over our sovereignty to um, rules that can be, can be created by this? And um, they signed up for this, but that it has to work this way um, to allow the compact to function. Um, states are um, joining, they're, give, they're allowing their delegate and their commissioner to participate in this rulemaking process, and the public can also participate in this rulemaking process, but rules do carry the force of law in member states. Um, if the, um, a simple majority of member state legislatures decide that a rule is just not tenable, that they can't make it work or it's way out of bounds, the state legislatures can veto a rule and then nullify that commission, that the commission passed that rule. Um, so we, it's a pretty, I don't think that we've seen that happen yet, but, um, we put that in there just to make sure that states maintain their sovereignty over their regulatory authority. Um, there is just like, um, you probably understand in your state, um, that your state probably has a rulemaking process that is set, that is either mirrors this or is very similar to this. Um, but the public is entitled to, you know, uh, understand what's going on in rulemaking because the Compact Commission is a public agency. It's a joint government agency of the member states. And so the public is entitled to, you know, have a say in what goes on. So uh, the commission is required to post a 30-day notice of rulemaking um, and an opportunity for a public hearing if one is requested by 25 people or from a government agency. So they're required to host a public hearing to hear concerns about the proposed rule um, if one is requested by a government agency or more than 25 people. And if the compact commission issues a rule that exceeds its authority under the compact, that rule shall be void and have no force or effect. So um, we try to make sure that states are as comfortable with section 11 in the rulemaking process as possible. Um, section 12, oversight, dispute resolution, and enforcement. And so this just covers uh, how, make to, to make sure that each state is complying with the compact properly. For instance, if a state was saying, yeah, we see that this person has a, um, is a license in good standing in a compact member state, and they've applied for a privilege in our state, but we just don't want to give it to them. There's a, a, a method through the compact to say, you are out of, this state is out of compliance. You need to issue that privilege and you need to come back into compliance. And there's corrective action for states that do not that are choose not to comply with the compact. Um, in the event of a failure by a member state, like repeated, the compact commission generally works with states to make sure that they are in compliance. Usually it has something to do with like making sure that they're consistently and accurately reporting their information to the data system. But if, for instance, if a state just completely fails to do those things and does not um, work with under corrective action to come into compliance, um, then there is a dispute resolution process under um, the compact in a way to basically enforce the terms of the compact on behalf of the other member states. Again, uh, we specify that there is a period of technical assistance for states. We want to give them a chance to make sure that they are in compliance. But if they continue to not be in compliance, they choose not to comply, then there is a way for the compact to legally enforce uh, the provisions of the compact. Um, and yeah, so that period of technical assistance speaks to that last bullet point. Um, they, there has to be an attempt to resolve any disputes that may arise between compact member states. Um, that's part of the technical assistance. You just don't want to kick someone out for not being able to comply immediately or for one instance of not being in compliance. We try to make sure that states stay in compliance, carry out the terms of the compact appropriately, and we give them the benefit of the doubt and um, as much chance as we can to stay to be in compliance and to participate in the compact. You, compacts really do not want to um, kick another state, a member state out of a compact. Um, 
Section 13 deals with the date of implementation. So um, basically, uh, each compact has a threshold of member states that once they meet that, then they are able to establish that uh, that compact commission and work to activate the compact for licensees. This section specifies that. Um, states that join after that initial threshold are also, um, this section specifies that they are subject to the rules of the commission as they exist when they join the compact. So compacts do have a little bit of benefit for states that are willing to join first, uh, be the among that uh, first group of states to enact um, because they, you know, excuse me, I've been talking quite a lot, my throat's getting a little scratchy, um, because uh, those initial states that join do get to write the initial rules and the initial bylaws and set the initial policies, but states that join after, they are subject to those rules of the commission when they join. Um, also, should a state join a compact and then participate and then just say, you know what? Uh, no, we don't think this is really working. This isn't for us. We don't want to participate in this any part. We don't want to be part of this. There is a way for them to withdraw from the compact. We've never really seen it um, within licensure compacts, and we're glad about that. Um, but uh, there is a process for doing that. And so um, they basically, uh, states are able to leave a compact the same way they got in. They have to pass a repealing um, statute to leave the compact. So just as they joined by enacting the model legislation, they have to enact a piece of legislation to leave the compact as well. And um, to make sure the licensees aren't um, sort of held out to dry in that process, should a state leave a compact, it takes about six months at, should a state ever um, withdraw from a compact to protect licensees and give them a chance to um, get licenses in the states in which they um, intend to practice and to allow for the wind down in the uh, administrative process as well. Um, member states also can collectively amend the compact, but they do not take effect until they are acted, enacted into the laws of all member states. You really don't wanna ever have to amend a compact if you can avoid it. Um, it has happened, but you because you have to get that uh, amendment in every single member state before that amendment can take effect, um, you really only want to amend a compact if you absolutely have to. But the compact does provide for that in Section 13. Uh, Section 14, um, construction and severability. This is like boilerplate language that hopefully um, you'd never need to uh, read or understand again. But compact provisions are severable, which basically means that if some if a provision of the compact is declared to be unconstitutional, then all of the other compact provisions remain valid for the member states, um, except for the part that was determined to be unconstitutional. Um, and so that just ensures the compact survives should something go wrong with one of the provisions. And if a provision is held contra contrary to a member state's constitution, not the United States constitution, the compact retains its full force in all of the other states and all of the other provisions remain valid. So the state has, for instance, a uh, constitutional provision or create an amendment to their constitution that somehow, um, gosh, I can't think of a good example, um, but, and that's probably a good thing because uh, we try to avoid those types of things. Uh, but if there were, if a state were ever to pass an amendment to their constitution that would create a problem for the compact, that would only apply um, to that individual state and not all of the other member states and um, would um, all of the provisions that remain valid in um, the affected state. So, it would, uh, the conflict um, would be resolved in that state that has an issue, but all of the other provisions would remain in effect. Um, lastly, there's one section on binding effect of the compact and other laws, reiterates that licensees must adhere to the laws and regulations, including the scope of practice. We've I don't know how many times I've mentioned that now, but it's several, and it's because it's very important. Licensees must adhere to the laws and regulations, including the scope of practice, in of the state in which the client is located at the time they are practicing. So when you are meeting with a client in a remote state, you apply by um, the, that state's scope of practice and laws and regulations. If you are meeting with a client in your home state, you abide by your home state's laws, regulations, and scope of practice. Just follow the laws, rules, and regulations of the state in which the client is located. Very important. Um, and 
it reiterates and strengthens the provision that all rules and bylaws of the commission are binding on the member states. So with that, um, a lot of that was boilerplate, but hopefully, especially the sections about section four, about the privilege to practice, section five, about the transfer of a privilege to practice to a home state license, section three, that member state requirement. Hopefully that information was helpful to you. We wanted to make sure that you had a good understanding of the compact legislation um, without having to go through and read it line by line, but that as um, we move into legislative sessions, you're able to um, understand what's in the model legislation and at, um, be able to explain it and understand it, um, especially as bills proceed through legislators or legislatures this um, at the start of the year. Um, with that, um, I do we do want to give everybody a break um, to make sure that we're staying um, within the time we allotted for this and to be respectful of everyone's time. We are going to keep this break a little short. So ideally, um, let's take eight minutes. I have at 2.22, at 2.23 Eastern right now. Um, if everybody could be back at 2.30, that should keep us on schedule um, to wrap things up by 3.30, which is what we um, had in the agenda. So if everybody wants to go ahead and take a break now and see you back at 3.30, um, we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much.
Okay. Uh, it's just now 2.30, so welcome back, everyone. I know that wasn't a super long break, but hopefully allowed you to get a sip of water, stretch your legs a little bit, um, and so well, gets us ready to jump back into our presentation here. Um, so with that, um, we are going to move on to the next item in our agenda, which covers the impact and benefits of the counseling compact. Um, and with that, I am going to hand things over to my colleague, Carl Sims. All right, thank you, Keith. Uh, if we go to the next slide here, we'll start things off. And, and really the, the key thing here uh, for these uh, next few slides is really underlining a lot of the benefits that have already been established early in the presentation, but wanting to make sure we're emphasizing those and being able to talk about them more in particular for uh, different groups, uh, groups of people, how they apply to uh, different parts of state government as well, uh, just so you have that greater awareness of the impact and benefits of the Council Compact overall. So as we've established and as we'll talk about further here, that the compact specifically will strengthen state workforces, increase healthcare access because of the reduction of barriers to multi-state practice. Uh, so because of that reduced practice, there's avail availability and ability for uh, counselors to be able to, to more often practice across state lines and all the benefits that come along with that. Um, while the counseling compact is, is not yet operational, we do know from other uh, lecture compacts that are currently uh, operational that there is a net benefit to that. So, for example, there's studies from the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact and the Nurse Licensure Compact showing positive effects on the availability of uh, providers for compact member states versus non-compact member states. Also, benefits for states um, at large is it preserves their state autonomy here. So, compacts reflect state uniformity. It is not changing things such as a uh, scope of practice within a state. Uh, there's still certain provisions um, as far as states being able to apply their own laws and regulations when taking adverse actions against someone still who's licensed in their state or maybe using a privilege of practice in their state. So the compact is not changing that part of how uh, licensure works. Um, and then also important that the compact provides a bi-directional mobility of practitioners. And what we mean by that is that you might be more familiar with those reciprocity policies or uh, by endorsement policies, I should say more in particular, uh, that help with those coming into a state. Uh, and doesn't necessarily provide those who are already licensed in that state. So just as there could be, uh, in this case, less professional counselors, the greater ability for them to start providing services in your state, uh, you as a licensee can also now um, go through and, and through the compact, uh, provide services in states outside of your, your current home state. And a lot of other policies don't have that, that bi-directional approach here. So there's a dual benefit there to be had uh, to allow that, that flow of services across states. So for benefits for practitioners, so again, it's providing that facilitated authorization for multi-state practice and doing so in a way that uh, reduces the time and effort that would otherwise be needed uh, going through a traditional pathway or, or even maybe a lecture by endorsement pathway uh, that might otherwise exist because you're not having to resubmit information that a state, or at least the one that you're licensed in, already has and is able to provide another state. Uh, so because there's already that agreement in the compact legislation, establishing the terms that, yes, we will provide you that compact privilege, you can meet this criteria, and a compact member state providing what that you know criteria and how you're meeting it to begin with, there doesn't need to be that protracted application and review process that might otherwise exist. Uh, it can be a really expeditious process into getting that authorization. And so there as a practitioner, you're having a greater reach of services that you're able to provide. And then from the uh, client side, which is, I believe, our next slide here. Oh, first, we'll get to sorry, Keith, next slide here. First, we'll get to licensing boards here. So uh, for boards in particular, important for them to know that, again, they're having the preservation of their scope of practice, someone using the compact to apply for uh, and use a compact privilege in their state has to buy by that scope of practice. The initial licensure process is also maintained. So the compact is voluntary. So it doesn't change if someone just wants to get licensed in the state and not use the compact or someone wants to just get licensed in another state and not use the compact for whatever reason, there's still that process in place. It's not replacing uh, that. For licensing boards, also, they're getting information as far as the, the data system is concerned of uh, uh, what is being shared as far as eligibility from those licensed professionals, as well as that disciplinary information that can be shared across state lines so that there can be a, 
uh, quick assessments and then action uh, if needed based on their own laws and regulations uh, that might not uh, be as expeditious as otherwise um, as, it, as it currently exists here. And because of the nature of the legislation, the formation of the, of the compact, as well as the work of the Compact Commission, there is cooperation uh, that exists here in regulating the profession for multi-state practice that's inherent to the very nature of the compact. On the next slide, so uh, benefits for patients here. So obviously they're gonna be benefiting from the increased access to healthcare services. And this is particularly true in cases of things like continuity of care. So if someone is temporarily locating or permanently re relocating to a different state, there otherwise you know, might be particularly a barrier if you as provider are licensed uh, in that state that your client is either temporarily or permanently uh, relocating to, that the compact is helping make that uh, a little bit easier for you to continue to provide those services to that person. And because we're increasing the availability of providers that are available within a state, it can also help promote practitioner diversity that may be available to patients that might best meet their exact needs in particular. And that can also be inclusive of increased access to specialists uh, by making that multi-state uh, portability easier as well. So as Keith had established here, uh, benefits from military families in particular, having to move across state lines much more than the national average here. And because of that, um, having to otherwise navigate that life share process, compacts particularly have a, a good benefit for them. Um, we have partners at the uh, Department of Defense, their Defense State Liaison Office, we'll have a slide at the very end uh, showing their regional liaisons in the states that they cover. Uh, and they're very helpful to the process in communicating with states on the value of compacts and, and helping along with that effort here. Uh, but just pointing back again to Section 6 of the compact that provides uh, those specific benefits for military families on top of what already is in there by um, making that enhanced licensure portability a possibility. Okay, um, next we're going to go on to a guide to legislative efforts in your state. So uh, first we're going to uh, recap uh, some of the key topics here uh, that we presented so far, but again, are really important to underline. As you're thinking about this in your state and communicating with uh, different stakeholders, uh, it's important to keep these in mind because these are common questions uh, that we get in and different talking points that might exist um, in that legislative process. So just wanted to make sure that we're really highlighting that information for you. And it also serves as a nice kind of uh, recap from a lot of the information that's been presented here today. So uh, we'll quickly go through these on the uh, next slide here. So again, compacts are voluntary. Not everyone may qualify for a compact. Not everyone might want to use a compact uh, if it is passed in your state. So again, there are other pathways if someone wants to get licensed in another state or, or go through another a portability pathway. So um, it's not replacing those other policies that might otherwise exist. Now I get to interrupt you, Carl. Okay, uh, great. I think that I really want to emphasize that point about compacts being voluntary because I get a lot of questions from counselors about my client moves to another state and it's another compact state. Do I have to apply for a privilege to practice to follow that client and provide continuity of care? And the answer is no, that's a decision between you and your client that under the code of ethics, that it is absolutely permissible to terminate your client and uh, refer them as appropriate to whatever services are available. And under the compact, that will be a little bit easier to find qualified people who are available to provide those services. So you don't have to follow your clients around the country. You know, and you don't have to participate if you don't want to. So I don't think anybody should feel like this is making them do that. Thank you for that addition, Lynn. Uh, keep up note. Next slide. Um, our next point is that your state's already a member of many interstate compacts and not even necessarily a licensure compact. So you saw from our heat map earlier in the presentation, there are a, a couple states out there a member of zero licensure compacts that includes Massachusetts, New York, uh, California. But even with those states that, and as we had uh, shown on earlier slide, your state's a member on of average 42, 43 interstate compacts because interstate compacts cover a wide range of policy areas. Uh, states aren't unfamiliar to them. So if it otherwise seemed like a foreign concept that my state would never be a part of something like an interstate compact, well, they're a member of 
of dozens of them already. Um, so it's sometimes useful context just to know that this is not charting a new territory for a state and that they, are, they already have many that are currently in use. Uh, again, just underlining here as well, the Council Compact is limited to licensed professional counselors. So those that assess, diagnose, and treat is the defined term in the Compact Model Legislation. So I just want to make sure that uh, we're bringing that up again and highlighting it for you for your awareness. Again, the Compact Privilege provides the same benefits as licensure. So providing that full authorization to practice within a state um, with the, of course, benefits um, that we had talked about uh, throughout the presentation here, but the, but the prominent privilege is equivalent to a licensure in what it provides you and authorizes you to do um, for practicing the state. As we talked about with the bi-directional approach of compacts, again, it compacts providing a benefit to both those who are already licensed in your state or which to provide services in another state for uh, whatever reason, um, as well as those who are wanting to newly seek and provide services um, in a state there. So that dual benefits are, I think, are really important to underline. Uh, sometimes what we hear in states that if it's, you know, that there's not that perceived benefit that those are already licensed in your state and it's just helping those that are outside of your state, but no, it, it has helping in both directions there. Compacts are also complementary to other state policies. As we said, they don't replace those other policies uh, as well. So it should be seen as an added policy to those overall goals to, to increase access to health care, to strengthen state workforces, um, and, and not seen as something that's otherwise competing with those. The compact reflects the uniformity of how states regulate ALPCs. So um, one thing that we didn't talk at length about, but the compact was created through a very exhaustive stakeholder-driven process. And from that, take into account many different voices from licensing boards, from LPCs, um, from other stakeholders. So it's really reflecting both the needs and how the profession is currently regu regulated across states. So again, we're not creating uh, something new here because we're respecting things such as scope of practice, providing services in, in the state, and, and really those state participation requirements and individual state participation, individual participation requirements are reflective of what we saw in the development process of how states are already uh, regulating things for LPCs. Um, as Keith had mentioned at the top, um, the compact legislation, and because of its contractual nature, is already established and it cannot substantively change from the model legislation as it's going through the legislative process. States are agreeing to the same language, that's what makes it a contract, and they're they're not able to, to make those substantive changes and still be a participating compact member. So that's the service that uh, CSG provides in partnership with the American Counseling Association to help ensure that as legislation is being introduced, we're checking to make sure that language does conform to what's in the model legislation and communicating that out to the state stakeholders, uh, the sponsors, um, if there is anything that might be deemed substantive so uh, they're aware of ahead of time uh, or in, during the legislative process. A lot of times in states, we'll get questions regarding commission rulemaking, um, and sometimes the misconception that commission rulemaking can go outside the bounds of what's in the compact legislation. The compact commission can only issue rules that are narrowly confined to what's authorized within the compact. Uh, so we had an example of a rule that we talked about and had linked in the chat as well regarding naming the national exams, uh, for instance, that um, as a state requirement uh, must be a condition for licensure for a state to be able to participate. So that's an example of a rule that a state would issue. Uh, there's many others, um, or at least a handful of others that are posted on the compact uh, website. So you can take a look at what those look like. Um, but the compact commission can't go outside of the, the again, the bounds of the compact. Um, there is a protracted rulemaking process that allows for public comment and review um, that you might be familiar with in your own state. And there's also an added safeguard that we haven't seen uh, ever used, but it's still there as a safeguard that allows states to reject a rule for legislatures to reject a rule, reject a rule by commission if it, it does deem to go outside of the compact. Again, we haven't experienced before, but there are a number of different safeguards and processes in place um, to help conform to that, um, that critical idea and purpose of the rulemaking, uh, just effectuating the purposes of the compact.
and I think this might be the last one, but compacts have deliberate timelines. So uh, just know that both through the creation of the compact, because it was gathering so many different uh, voices and assessing how states are regulating the profession, uh, it took a you know a good amount of time to create the legislation. It's something you don't want to rush, particularly once you get the model legislation. And as we stated, you can't change it, you know, or in order to not uh, jeopardize that contractual nature. Or if you do, it requires states to then um, to to readopt the, the legislation, which uh, can be another protracted process here. So uh, there's an intentional timeline there, as well as um, the legislative process itself. That kind of phase two of things, once compact legislation is available, um, it has to go through that process. And as you all know, um, as states you know may not meet um, year round, or may meet every other year, or just kind of the normal process that legislation. Uh, can take as far as its journey, uh, that can take a while. And even with the the very quick um, rate of enactment that we've seen with counseling compact, uh, it, it still has to go through that process and it took a couple of years for it to reach its activation threshold. And now that we're onto our third state as we're adding more compact states, but working to make the compact operational, that's requiring the startup of that compact commission, get all those processes and uh, governance structures in place, creating that compact data system and an information technology system uh, to use for the compact. So, uh, so that also requires a, a good amount of resources, time to develop that. Uh, but once it does become operational, um, there's not a lot of other, you know, huge steps that need to happen afterwards, and that allows for those LDCs then uh, to go through that process. And it's a matter of the administration of those existing policies here. So just by the nature of compacts requiring that intense coordination and creating that new governance structure um, does have that protracted timeline overall. Okay, now we'll get into support for state efforts. And on the next slide, I believe we'll then turn to Lynn to, to cover this content. Thanks, Carl. So the enthusiasm for compacts is tremendous. And I know that there's always a groundswell within states to move a compact forward, but it has to be done in a really organized way. And so one of the things that we've seen and the advantage, I think that those of you who represent states that have not yet enacted the compact or joined the compact have, is that a lot of the um, issues that have been dealt with by other groups. So we've learned some lessons. And one of them is that all the counseling groups need to be supportive. We've seen a few cases where um, there were more than one counseling organization involved in wanting to pass legislation, but they had different ideas about what it should look like. So everybody has to be on the same page. And you need a committed group of counselors who are going to do the heavy lifting, the hard work of getting legislation enacted. So you need some one or one's groups. Lots of times it's the Public Policy and Legislative Committee of the State Counseling Association or the clinical counselors, but you have to have a group of people who are going to coordinate the effort, who are going to get everybody moving in the same direction and make sure that all of the things that need to be done are going to be done because it's a lot of work. If you think about it, it's not quite as much work as getting licensure passed, but it's almost as much work in some cases. And then you have to have a system for spreading the word. So who are your audiences? Whom do you need to involve in letting them know? One of the things that amazes me a little bit, and I don't know why it does, um, is that there's so much misinformation out there about the compact. And I'll talk to people from different states who'll say, well, we aren't interested in the compact because somebody said something about the compact. I'm like, that's not how it works. You know, that's not true. So you need to make sure that everybody has accurate information and that you're involving counselors and programs, counselor education programs are critically important. While students are not eligible and, and new graduates are not eligible to participate in the compact to gain a privilege, they can still be very helpful in understanding what's going on and, and providing assistance. And so there's a lot of work that's involved with all of that, um, getting bills introduced and lobbying and coordinating and, and public relations and, and spreading the word. The licensing board is a second group that you're going to be working with. 
Now, in most states, the licensing board can't lobby, but at some point, the legislature is probably going to come to them and say, "Do you are you supportive of joining the compact? And you need to ensure that the board understands the compact and is supportive and wants to be part of this, or is at least neutral. Some of the concerns that we've heard from licensing boards have to do with it's going to be more work. We're going to need more staff. We can't do this. We're going to be flooded with applications. So you need to help them understand. And this is where we're all very, both ACA and CSG are very helpful in working with licensing boards to help them understand that there's actually less work involved because you're accepting the license of somebody who was already licensed. The application is done through the commission webpage. The board itself does not have to review, as, as both Carl and Keith have said, does not have to re review any of the documentation that the counselor submitted for initial licensure. They get a little, they'll get something that says this counselor has been approved. And all they have to do is coordinate the jurisprudence exam if it's required and grant the privilege. So it isn't more work. It's not going to cost them more money. And in fact, in many cases, it alleviates a lot of the paperwork that they currently have with people applying for licenses uh, who want to practice in that state and have a license in other states as well. And then you have to find legislative sponsors and supporters who are willing to uh, support the legislation. CSG is extremely helpful through our and through our contacts with the Department of Defense, because there is somebody, except for those three states that keep getting mentioned, um, there are sponsors in every state, legislators in every state who have passed other, who've supported other compact legislation. And that's always a good place to start. So if you have somebody who has sponsored counseling legislation in the past, that's great. If not, you know, CSG can be very helpful. And in this process as well, when you get a bill, you know, they'll want to review it. And then there are lots of other community resources and supports. Your business community is very supportive of the counseling compact. And I've had a number of conversations with SHRM, which is the Society for the Management of Human Resources, which obviously has an international reach, but within the United States, this is part of their platform. And their legislative um, staff talk a lot about the counseling compact, because if you're, a, you're an HR professional in a company that has offices all across the country and mental health is a significant issue for your company, then clearly you want your employees to be able to access services anywhere they are, regardless of where they move and what office they're currently working out of or whether they're remote. So we have a lot of those kinds of supports, Department of Defense, and we need to utilize them and find out who else. Clients frequently can be very helpful, the public. One of the things that we saw is that um, we finished the draft legislation and introduced it and then the pandemic hit. So it was a miracle that passed in any states that year. But the irony of the pandemic is it demonstrated the need for increasing the availability and access to mental health services. And so we see very little uh, opposition to the compact. And lots of times when we do, it's more from misinformation than from the compact itself. And so as you work with people, that's why I keep emphasizing the need to ensure that everyone has accurate information because all it takes is one person saying, no, you know, you can't join the compact because uh, we have had some states that have had to change their licensing laws because they didn't have a 60 hour option and they have done that to be part of the compact um, through various different mechanisms. The, and it's also important to understand the compact doesn't impact initial licensure. The state still controls who is licensed within their state for initial licensure. So what has happened in some states is there's a, two, a dual pathway. 
There are people who have a single state license because the state did not require 60 hours, but when they want to participate in the compact, they have a 60 hour licensure pathway that is utilized for the compact. Uh, although almost everybody has moved to 60 hours. So we're happy to talk more. ACA's uh, Government Affairs and Public Policy staff is happy to help. I'm Dominique is still on, on the call, although I know she has another meeting shortly, um, and CSG. So we collaborate on these efforts. We're happy to help you within your state get started. I know that um, sometimes it's a little frustrating when there's one legislator who's not supportive, but we have 38 states. We've made a lot of progress. And I think the that we're going to see that some of the other states are going to want to uh, be part of this as well. So happy to answer more questions, but I just want you to think about who's going to do the work, how are you going to get your board involved, and how are you going to work with your legislation, legislature? Keith? Hey, thank you, Lynn. That is very helpful information. And yes, yeah, so, uh, that or, being organized when it comes to the advocacy in your state and knowing who's going to do the work and how it gets done is essential information to legislative success. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, additionally, we do want to um, uh, talk a little bit about the support that CSG provides um, as legislative support in concert with ACA. So um, CSG, as a part of its work with ACA for the Counseling Compact, reviews all drafts of the bills that are filed in state legislatures to enact the compact. So when we are notified or work ahead with a sponsor um, that a bill will be drafted to enact the counseling compact, um, we take a look at that draft of the bill. Some states have different drafting rules or they think that it's um, they can make certain changes. I know Carl mentioned this earlier, but you can't make substantive changes. What CSG does is uh, get um, the text of that bill reviews it literally word by word to make sure that um, the in the, the bill that they are enacting will um, is in compliance with the model legislation and will allow that state to become a member. Um, additionally, um, because CSG um, and comes with the ACA facilitated the development of the of the counseling compact, um, we also provide legislative testimony uh, and committee testimony. Um, when bills come before legislatures, when they're filed and when they're uh, assigned to a committee, um, a CSG staffer um, will uh, either attend virtually or show up in person um, to uh, answer any questions to provide essential information about uh, what is in the compact, uh, similar to the section by section review that we did earlier today. So we will show up in states um, and uh, perform that work to ensure that the decision makers and the policy makers and the legislators who are considering the uh, model legis or the bill with the model legislation um, know what's in it. And then finally, we provide educational assistance. So if after all of that, there's still questions or maybe there's a state specific issue, um, CSG will address it. And so uh, there is currently a toolkit on uh, the Counseling Compact website that provides a loads of educational, inf the educational resources but we'll also address uh, state-specific issues or answer questions via memos or with, in concert with ACA to states should they have any additional questions. We really want to make sure that we're not you know, uh, hiding anything in this. We want to make sure everyone is aware and this is done in the daylight and that everyone knows what's in this legislation. Uh, so I mentioned le um, educational resources. Um, as part of the uh, information I provided on the last slide, if you go to the Counseling Compact website and you click on the Legislative Toolkit, you can download a copy of the model legislation. You can find fact sheets. You can find this section-by-section -section summary. You can find answers to frequently asked questions. There's fact sheets on there. Lots of things that instead of reading the model legislation can explain what is in it and explain how the compact works. Um, it also is a good resource for the compact map, so you can go through, see which states have already enacted, see which states have active legislation, um, and see what uh, where the bill status is there. You can also see where a state has filed the legislation, but maybe it didn't pass in a given session, and they're trying again. And so um, it's a lot of information on the specific state legislative efforts via that compact map. Uh, lastly, we'd be remiss, and Lynn mentioned this within her um, section, 
on how to get involved in, um, and how to advocate for the compact in your state. We, uh, CSG um, has a cooperative agreement with the Department of Defense for uh, the creation and the support of interstate compacts. Um, and we work very closely with the Defense State Liaison Office. And so um, these, uh, the Defense State Liaison Office is broken down by region. You can find uh, this information. This, if you Google uh, Def Department of Defense, Defense State Liaison Officer, uh, search for it online, you can find their website. And then you can find all of these regional liaisons here and contact them um, directly. Um, and they can be a big help as you advocate for the compact in your state. Um, so make sure to um, check out this in the information on this slide, visit their website, and get in touch with those regional liaisons um, as you um, as we continue as we go into the legislative sessions in 2025 for assistance with that enactment work. Um, and then I think that uh, covers the end of the content for our presentation. Um, so it is right at three o'clock. And I think that that's what we said uh, would be the end of things here. And we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and share a PDF of the slides in the chat. If you want a copy of that for your reference or records, please make sure to download that um, before the end of the presentation. Um, but I will be able to hang on here and Lynn, will you be able to as well to answer questions? Um, so we'll be happy to do that now. But um, so if you have questions, please use the hand raise function um, or um, submit questions in the chat. We'll uh, um, probably hang on here for just a few more minutes and answer as many questions as you can. Okay. If you have a question and want to raise your hand, go ahead and do that now. Uh, Lori, see your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Um, and I apologize if you covered this early on. I was I was not there at the beginning. Uh, what about states that have, uh, at the time you were licensed, they had 45 credits and, and you were licensed with the 45 and now that state has 60. Will you be grandfathered in? Great question. Lynn, there, card, you guys there, there is a, um, mechanism within the compact we we don't use the term grandparenting i'm trying to clean up my my language we use the term legacy license and uh dr andrea brooks is on it thank you andrea i would have gotten the word eventually so yes we tried when we were developing the uh, language for the draft legislation. We tried to be very respectful of people who were fully licensed under previous requirements in state, who had 36 or 48 hour degrees, who may not, we still have people who were licensed before exams were required, or who may have you know various hours of post-degree supervision. And you still have to meet the requirements. So if you have a license in good standing, that you met all the requirements at the time you were licensed, there are no sanctions against your license, and um, you meet the other requirements, taking the jurisprudence exam if required, then you can be granted a privilege through the, the compact. Um, and Andrea is reminding us that the rule was passed, which I knew, but um, at our meeting Tuesday. So that is now the rule. That was in the, the proposed legislation, and that is now the rule. So yes, we want it, we recognize that there are a lot of people out there who've been practicing for years who were licensed under other requirements and didn't want to penalize anybody. Thanks for your question, Lori. Um, I see another hand raised and Julia, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Thank you so much for this presentation and all the work that's gone into this. It's amazing. Um, I just logistically switched devices. Would you be able to post the link for the slide deck again? Um, I I would appreciate that so I can save it to my computer. That was it. Thank you. Uh, sure. You should just be able to reopen the chat, but I can try to do that. Maybe it's not giving you access to that um, on your new device. Here, I'll try to post that again. Keith, we also got a question in the 
chat. Um, I think this was also an earlier question from another attendee about the cost of the compact application. And just so we could speak more uh, directly about that, uh, there will be a fee for an LPC to be able to use the compact. So it will be structured in, in for a two fee structure, uh, but collected as one at the time of application. So the compact commission uh, will assess the fee and they're taking steps right now to establish uh, what that fee will be. And then the compact member state will also determine its fee. So each state will have the ability to set uh, what that fee might be. So whenever you go to apply for a compact privilege, once everything's up and running, uh, you would select the state you want to practice in uh, the application process and then see that fee structure, the commission fee, which will be the same across uh, no matter what state you're applying for, and then the individual um, uh, state fee as well. So that's yet to be determined. But what I will say from what we've seen from other compacts, which are operational, that uh, typically these are said to be uh, about the same or less than what a license fee would be. Um, just being that the overall objective to help, you know, increase the uh, the use of and the availability of um, more services for uh, clients, that that's kind of within the objectives. Uh, but obviously, there's different um, finances that need to be considered here, uh, the individual cost and fee structures that states experience uh, that can influence this. So, um, again, that's something to, to still um, uh, come up, um, but there are efforts underway to get those fees established. Thank you, Carl. It's an important question. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised and I'm not seeing um, any other questions in the chat. Um, so with that, we do wanna make sure that we're being up. Oh, I see up oh, Chad, uh, saved by the bell. Good, uh, feel free to go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, I was just trying to type it real quick. Quick question, you guys clarified that the CEUs align with your home state. However, on one of the slides, you were talking about the jurisprudence rules. So like if a state has a specific state requirement for a CEU that you have to take, you're saying you'd also have to at least take that aside from your CEUs of your of your state. Do you know what I mean? Uh, does that make sense? It, your question makes sense, but let's clarify. Yes. You only have to do continuing education for your home state license. You do not have to do continuing education for any other state. If the state requires, if a, another compact state requires a jurisprudence exam and you want a privilege, that's the only thing you have to do. So you don't, you can have 10 privileges if that's what you want. And if all 10 states require jurisprudence exams, you'd have to do each of the jurisprudence exams, but you would never have to do a CE, meet those continuing education requirements for any of those other compact states. So they're two separate issues. Thank you. Thanks. Good question, Chad. Appreciate that. The other found folks on that help bill. Um, I'll reiterate last call to raise your hand if you have a question or submit it in the chat. All right. Hearing none and seeing none. Um, we will wrap things up. So we really want to thank everyone for your interest and for taking the time to attend this uh, legislative summit. Um, we know that you have, there are other things you could do with your time, and we appreciate your commitment to the profession and your interest in the compact. We hope you found this information helpful. Should you want to reach out or have any other questions that you just didn't think of um, during this presentation, but it's something that occurs to you later, feel free to reach out to us at the contact information on screen. Um, otherwise, thank you again for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at another presentation on the Counseling Compact soon. Thanks, everybody.